Open your Bibles today to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. It's on page 841 if you want to use a Bible on the pew rack there in front of you. 841. And if you don't have a Bible, please take those home. Uh, We do have more uh, in the back workroom. It just hit me, Tony. You asked me to grab some more Bibles this morning, and I forgot. As we had, we needed five more for the pews, and I completely forgot. So we do have more. They're in the back workroom. Uh, But if you don't have one, please take one of those Bibles home. Everybody should have a Bible uh, that they understand well. Uh, Mark chapter 6. What's going on here in Mark chapter 6 is some very significant things. Jesus has been ministering for a little bit of time. He has gathered a following of quite a bit of people that he calls his disciples. And out of those disciples, he picked 12 people that he called apostles. And uh, he begins to show them things and teach them things. He actually, at the beginning of Mark chapter 6, he sends those 12 out on a job. Two by two, he sends them from town to town to town to go out and begin to tell people about Jesus being there, being the Son of God. Tell people the gospel. He also gave them authority, authority to teach, authority to heal. um, And they were to go in this way and not take anything with them. They weren't supposed to take any money. They weren't supposed to take any extra clothes. They weren't supposed to take any extra shoes. They weren't supposed to take any food of any kind. They were, supposed to, they were just supposed to show up in a town, start telling people about Jesus, and Jesus told them that God would provide everything they needed when they got into town. And so they had to trust God all throughout this process for everything they needed every single day. Jesus was telling them, you show up in town and you pop your sandal, somebody in town is going to provide you with new sandals. Just trust that God will take care of it. And so Jesus sent them out to do this. And while they're out doing this, uh, we get in in Mark chapter 6, last week we saw a flashback of uh, what happened to John the Baptist and all that he went through while he was in prison and how Jesus reached out to John the Baptist and sent messengers to him with encouragement. And because of that encouragement, John the Baptist shared with King Herod. Uh, We talked about how no one sits alone, ever, which was a challenge I gave to y'all, and some of y'all have done that this morning, sitting around the room where you're not normally sitting, because nobody should be sitting alone, especially at church. Everybody should have somebody reach out to them. It should give us an awareness of those around us. And so after this little flashback in Mark 6 of what happened to John the Baptist, the 12 apostles that Jesus had sent out come back, and they begin to tell Jesus what they were experiencing. So look at Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. So the disciples, the apostles come back, give a report of what they experienced. Undoubtedly, they're excited and uh, uh, having experienced so much at the hand of the Spirit. Um, But they were also exhausted from having done so much ministry 24-7. And in addition to that, people followed them back and continued to want to hear more teaching, continued to want more uh, uh, healing. And as we saw earlier in the book of Mark a few weeks ago, so many people were coming that they can't just sit down and eat. It made me think of, if you're a parent of young kids, and you go at mealtime, and you get your kids' food ready, and you hand the kids their food, and you go to fix your food, and by the time it's time for your food to be eaten, they're done with their food, and it's time to put their food up, and by the time you get to your food, it's cold, and you have to eat it standing up so you can chase them around the house kind of a situation. That's what this made me think of. They got no leisure time to eat. It didn't say they didn't have time to eat. They still ate, but they couldn't just sit down and relax and eat. They had to eat as they were going. They had to eat as they had a break, as they had a moment with all these people coming in wanting to see Jesus. And so it's just almost chaotic with so many people. And Jesus tells them, we need to get away by ourselves and have some refreshment time because we haven't had that. Verse 32, and they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves, or so they thought. Verse 33, now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So 
Jesus and the apostles get in a boat, and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is fairly large. I mean, it's a few miles across. But being a few miles across and, and being the Sea of Galilee, you can see, you know, a good distance. And so these people on the shore see these guys get in the boat, and they're trying to get across the Sea of Galilee, and they think we need to get over there because we still want to hear more. We still want more healing. And so they start running around the Sea of Galilee, probably keeping an eye on the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee to see where it lands. And they're running, you know, full out around the Sea of Galilee to get over there. So that when Jesus and the apostles touch down, there's a huge crowd that has showed up, probably panting. And as they're going, town to town, everybody's, where are you running to? Where are you going? You know, today it's, it's not unheard of to see people running down Colin Ray Drive, right? You see them keeping in shape and running, and you want to roll your window down and say, keep going, you got this. Uh, or maybe that's just me. Uh, and we're going, and, and they're running. But back then, people didn't run, like, unless you're being chased by something. That's the only time you're running. And so people are running around the Sea of Galilee, and as people see them, well, what are you running from? We're going to see Jesus, the healer. People get, gather with them, and they keep going around to where when they show up and Jesus lands over there, the crowd is enormous as more and more people are flocking, more and more people are coming. And it says it's a desolate place. It's the middle of nowhere where Jesus touches down, and these people show up where they are. Verse 34, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. So he begins to teach them many things, because he has compassion as they appear to him, sheep without a shepherd. They don't have a guide. They're, they're, they're guideless. They're aimless. Uh, they don't have a shepherd. They have no protection. They don't have a shepherd. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where to get fed. They, they, they uh, need help. And Jesus looks at them in this compassion and begins to teach them here. Now we know from some of the other tellings in the other gospels of this occasion that Jesus begins teaching them early in the day. And he's going to teach them all day long with no breaks. Just continuous teaching them all day long. I don't know if you've ever talked for a long time. I mean, just being up here preaching for 40 minutes, 45-ish, depending on how I go, my voice is running out of gas by the end. I can't imagine trying to project your voice with no microphone to thousands of people all day long and still having something in you by the end of the day. Jesus well, he's Jesus, but he goes all day long teaching without a break, just teaching and teaching because he wants the message to get in the people. So he's teaching. Verse, let's see, 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves, uh, or send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So Jesus has been teaching all day. Disciples come to him, say, Jesus, you got to send these people away so they can get some food. Because right in the middle of nowhere, you know, there's no little food cart, there's no food trucks, they can't go and get anything. You got to send them away. You know, when we read scripture, a lot of times when somebody says something, maybe you don't do this, I do this. I, try, I, I sometimes inject my thinking you know, onto that person. Like, if that were me, this is what I would be thinking in that moment. And so in this, in this moment, it, when the disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we've got to send these people away so they can get something to eat. If that were me, I'm thinking, I'm hungry. I can't just come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm hungry. Let's send them away. Let's send the people away. Let's have compassion on the people, Jesus. They need something to eat. It's not about me being, they need something to eat, Jesus. So the disciples come to Jesus, pull them aside in the middle of his teaching. These people need some food. We've got to send them away. It's been all day long. We've got to send them to get something to eat. But then Jesus gives them an answer they were not expecting. Verse 37. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? A denarius was a day's worth of wage for a day worker. 
That's how much they would make for working 10 to 12 hours a day was one denarius. So he says, they're saying 200 days worth of work for one person. And they're saying that would be enough maybe to buy a nibble for everybody in the crowd. That's just an estimation. I mean, it's, but that's a massive amount of money as they're trying to you know, throw out there that might be enough for these people to eat. And they're saying, Jesus, you expect us to go and do this. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. Now, if y'all were here a few weeks ago when we talked about the beginning of Mark 6, when Jesus sent the disciples out, remember, he said, uh, don't take any food with you, don't take any money with you, trust that God will provide. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, now you give these people something to eat. It might be in the disciples' mind to say, we're supposed to give these people something that we cannot give ourselves. How can we give them something to eat when we can't afford food for us, Jesus? This is, this is impossible. You're asking something that we can't fulfill. You're asking something that's too big. Jesus, we gotta, have you ever been on a plane, Jesus? They tell you to put your mask on first. We've got to feed ourselves first before we take care of these people. That's a joke. Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. And so look at that. He said to them, after their comment, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said five and two fish. Now, I want you to look at this from Jesus' perspective, right? He tells them, you give them something to eat. They said, we can't. We can't afford this. We don't have enough. And Jesus' response was, okay, well then what do you have? Jesus, what he's going to do is, is he's given them an assignment, give them something to eat. He's going to walk them through the process of how to do it. He's going to give them a step-by-step process of how to get this done. And so he starts right off. Okay, how many loaves do you have? Take inventory of what you have. And so they go out there. They find uh, this food, right? Uh, they find uh, uh, five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus tells them, verse 39, he commanded them all, sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. So he tells them all to sit down. They group them in the crowd and to groups of hundreds and groups of fifties. And this is, we're going to find out, this is a crowd of 5,000 men. Matthew tells us that's just the men they counted. That's not everybody. Scholars tell us that could, this crowd could be up to 20,000 or more is how massive this is. And so all these people are spread out into groups of 50s and 100s. And Jesus just has, you know, five loaves and two fish. And he looks up to heaven and he prays and he blesses it and he hands it to the disciples. The disciples begin to go out into the crowd with their little chunks to distribute it. And it somehow multiplies. It doesn't tell us. I mean, you can look there and search in between the lines. It doesn't tell us how or when this multiplied, just that it did. And they just kept handing out and kept handing out so much. Verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. Now, that word satisfied, that's, that's not just you, you, you ate until you're not hungry anymore. They ate and were full. I mean, they were satisfied. It's like Thanksgiving full. Like unbutton your pants full. It's like... You, you get the meat sweats full. You're, you're, you're falling asleep on the couch full. I mean, these guys are full. This is a lot of food that they are distributing out here. These people probably didn't expect to get anything out of this. And Jesus gave them so much food that they're saying, no, I, I cannot. I've got enough food to last me three days. I cannot eat any more food. They're all satisfied. Every single body, every single person in the crowd is satisfied. Verse 43 And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So 12 baskets. Every disciple had a basket. And they get to take the doggy bag, the leftover food. And, you know, they didn't have enough to provide for themselves. And here Jesus has provided for all 12 of them. For the next however long it took them to eat those leftovers that were there. But the disciples response initially to Jesus, you give them something to eat, was we can't because we don't have. We can't because we don't know how to do what you're asking. They were looking at what they didn't have in order to fulfill Jesus' instruction. 
But in reality, Jesus wanted them to see what they already did have. He wanted them to recognize what he had already provided among their group. It may have seemed unreasonable to them for Jesus to ask this massive thing. But the point wasn't for them to go looking for what they needed to accomplish the task. The point was for them to look what Jesus needed to accomplish the task. Because Jesus never expected the apostles to do this. He knew they couldn't do it. He knew they would need him to do it. Which is why he said, you give them something to eat. Go see what you have. You have loaves, you have fish, bring it to me. Their job was to see what they already had and bring it to Jesus. And Jesus would take care of it. The task was too big for them to accomplish. The point was for them to look to Jesus to accomplish the task among what he had already given them. And Jesus wasn't going to let them languish in confusion. He lays it out for them. Go find the loaves. Bring the loaves to me. I'm going to pray for it. Now go and pass the, the, the loaves and the fish out. He was going to provide all along. He intended to provide from the very beginning before they ever stepped foot in this field. But he needed the disciples to recognize where the source of provision really was. And he needed them to always be ready for the unexpectedly miraculous. They didn't step out there thinking they were going to witness a miracle that day. They thought Jesus is just going to teach all day. We're going to send the people away to get food. We're going to get food. We're going to sleep. And then we're going to go on to our little vacation Jesus said we were going to get. But there was something bigger at work that day. Jesus gave them this step-by-step walk through. And he does that with us giving us exactly what he wants us to do. When he has something for us, we've got to listen to him. We've got to do what happened here, plan and prepare and pray. But if you notice, we, when it comes to doing something, a lot, even doing something for Jesus, a lot of times we'll do the planning and preparing, but almost always we end up praying as, a, as an afterthought. Oh, and, 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 and Jesus, bless what I'm already doing here. But the, pl- the prayer is a fundamental element to everything God wants us to do. We can't really plan and prepare if we're not praying, because if we're not praying, we're not going to know what God wants us to do. We can accomplish nothing of eternal significance without prayer. All of the planning and all of the preparation in the world comes to nothing if there is no prayer laced throughout it. All the planning and all the preparation are powerless without prayer. It's like a, like a car without fuel. Plans without prayer go nowhere. Plans without prayer go nowhere. They accomplish nothing. They get nowhere. We might feel like we're accomplishing a little bit, but there is no eternal significance if prayer is not instrumentally involved. Prayer is necessary during every part of the process. Without prayer, plans are merely our own plans without the Lord's guidance. It's us trying to accomplish something without the tools he's given us to accomplish it. Prayer enables us to accomplish his plans, and his plans are always the best plans. I mean, think about that day out there in the field. How are the disciples supposed to get all these people fed? They can't unless they bring it to Jesus. There is no accomplishment there without bringing it to Jesus. And this miracle, feeding the 5,000, besides the resurrection, this is the only miracle in all four Gospels. The only one in all four That never would have happened if the disciples hadn't followed Jesus, done his instruction, brought what they had to him, and him accomplish it. He can always accomplish it. But a lot of times we don't bring it to him to begin with because we feel as though we can accomplish it without him. We're not going to say that out loud because that sounds bad. I can do it without God. But the way we act sometimes, it's as though we can. We act sometimes as though our hands are the best hands. I have control over the situation. I can take care of it because I know what's going on. But there's no faith in that, and there's no trust in that, and that's not how we're expected to live by God. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to pray 
what is in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Today, I need today. So he tells the disciples, go out there and get enough for everybody. And they say, we can't, Jesus. He says, okay, get what you do have. Get what, you already, what I already gave you and bring it to me. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. Bring it to Jesus. Prayer helps us plan. Prayer helps us inventory. Prayer shows us what the Lord has already provided. If the disciples, the apostles, weren't communicating with Jesus, they never would have seen what they already had. They never would have seen what was already provided. Prayer, for us, it helps us prepare for what the Lord wants us to do. Because prayer puts your attention on Jesus. Prayer takes your attention off of whatever you're focused on, and it puts your attention on Jesus, which is foundational. Prayer puts your attention on Jesus. Now, the disciples hear this from Jesus. They witness this miracle. They understand, okay, we brought what we had to Jesus, and Jesus did this amazing thing that we could not do on our own if we just looked at Jesus and focus on Jesus. But look at what happens next. Verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. So Jesus sends the disciples out, dismisses the crowd, He goes up on the mountain and spends time in prayer. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. That word literally means with great torture. So torturously, they're trying to get across because the wind is is just pushing them back and pushing them back, and they cannot get across. He said, for the wind was against them. You ever feel like everything in nature is against you and what you're trying to do? Everything's beating you back. Even the thing, the wind, supposed to help you get across, is working, actively working against you, accomplishing the thing. The thing that Jesus told you to do, which for them was cross the sea. Uh, so they're making headway painfully. The wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, this is right before dawn, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them came to them walking on, he was walking on the sea in the middle of the storm. He's walking on the sea, the water, you know, pouring into the boat. He's walking on the water, which was the very thing the disciples felt was going to overwhelm them. He walked over what the disciples felt was going to overwhelm them. But there's that interesting phrase there in verse 48. He meant to pass by them. Now that word, to pass by, that literally means to come beside to come alongside. So it wasn't as though Jesus was going to, you know, walk past them and leave them out there in the storm. That wasn't what this says. He's going to pass beside them, up by them, next to them. Um, He was going to come up next to them, comfort them, be with them. He meant to pass right alongside them. Uh, Verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. That's also kind of confusing, right? They just went through this, saw Jesus walking in the water, saw Jesus calm the storm, and it says they were astounded because they did not understand about the loaves. Well, the loaves, that was a previous miracle. We're talking about walking on water now and stopping the storm. What does what not understanding about the loaves have to do with this miracle? Well, just the day before, they had seen Jesus provide far more than what they thought was possible. They'd seen Jesus do something beyond anything that they could understand. And they saw him do it. They they were part of it. And in reality, the experience of the day before should have informed how they experienced the storm that day. I mean, it was just yesterday, right? It was just the night before, just a few hours before. They they should have allowed Jesus' provision to inform how they were experiencing the storm. But maybe you can relate to this, sometimes when we're in the middle of a storm, we forget what happened yesterday. 
when we're in the middle of, of everything working against us, we forget what Jesus has already done. We forget how we got there. We forget what he had, I mean, it's easy to look back at the Old Testament and see, you know, God part the Red Sea for the Israelites, and like three days later, they're complaining that God hadn't done anything for them. Like, you just saw the Red Sea part. Well, here's the same deal with the disciples, and truth be told, we do it today. God can do something phenomenal for us yesterday, and then something happens this morning, and everything that happened yesterday is blown out of our mind, and we forget. And we start reacting poorly to everybody and we're getting mad at everything that's happening and we can't understand and we're mad because our shoe is messed up and we're mad because the kid lost the remote to the TV and we're not mad about any of that stuff. We're mad because this thing's happening. We don't understand this thing's happening. But in reality, you know what the point was a minute ago? Prayer puts our attention on Jesus. When our attention gets on the storm and all the other things, it messes us up. And we begin to react poorly to everything around us. Because our attention is off of Jesus. And we're not following where he wants us to follow. We're not doing what he wants us to do. The disciples missed it. They they, they missed the fact that Jesus was the answer to yesterday's issue. So, naturally, they missed that he was the answer for today's issue. Yesterday, all they saw was what they didn't have. All they saw was what they couldn't do, rather than all that Jesus could provide, all that Jesus could do. They only saw in the storm, they only saw the difficulty of the wind, they only saw the problem of the storm, they kept their attention on how insurmountable it was to them. They kept their attention on their own inability to overpower the strength of the wind, and it resulted in this phenomenal fear. In their jumping to conclusions, their assumption that Jesus walking on the water was a ghost. To them, in the middle of the storm, it made more sense that there was a ghost on the sea, that none of them believed in ghosts, but it made more sense that it was a ghost than it was Jesus. Sometimes when we're in a storm, we believe the craziest stuff. When the wind is howling and things are going nuts, we believe the craziest things. If you don't believe that, just get on Twitter for five seconds. When everything goes crazy, people believe crazy things. The disciples are are believing a ghost. And Jesus says, no, guys, do not fear. It's me. It's me. With their attention on how strong they felt the storm was, their reaction, of course, was fear and doubt and superstition. Because they were looking at what they could not do. They were looking at what they were unable to accomplish, overpower the storm, just like the day before. They were unable to provide for all these people when Jesus never wanted them to. He wanted them to turn to him in the storm. They weren't supposed to overpower the storm. They were supposed to turn to Jesus, look to Jesus. Now, when Jesus spoke, they recognized his voice. But if they were really looking at Jesus and not the power of the storm, they would have recognized that it was Jesus. But they weren't looking for Jesus. They were looking at the size of the waves. They were feeling the power of the wind rather than looking to Jesus. They needed what Jesus had showed them the previous day. They needed to put their attention on Jesus. They needed prayer. Because remember, prayer puts Our attention on Jesus. And when your attention is on Jesus, your reaction changes. Prayer puts your attention on Jesus, and your attention determines your reaction. Your attention determines your reaction. If if your attention is on the, the mess, or let me rephrase that. If your attention is on your perception of the mess, how you see it as a mess, then all you're going to see is something messed up. Because I don't know if you have seen this true in your life. You find what you look for. If you look for somebody messed up, that's all you're going to see. If you're looking at somebody and you're saying, that person always messes up, that's all you're going to see is them messing up. Again, you don't believe me? Get on social media after the Cowboy game tonight. All you're going to see is people talking about the mess ups. 
or the Razorback game. I mean, yesterday was a unique experience for all Razorback fans that uh, we need to revel in that before the next game because you never know what can happen in the next game. We're gonna, this is our Super Bowl was yesterday. Uh, the, the national championship. Um, Alabama lost, so we'll just claim that too. Uh, but you never know what's going to happen. And you got to put your attention on Jesus. Because if, if you're looking for the mistakes and you're looking for the size of the storm, and with that, if you surround yourself with people who only talk about the size of the storm, that's all you're going to see too. If all that you're ingesting through your ears and your eyeballs and your thumbs is, is people talking about how bad the storm is, how high the waves are, how strong the wind is, that's all you're going to see. That's all you're going to see. And you're going to start to think, man, it really is that bad. Like, for real. Like, and then you begin to have those thoughts, and they just roll around over and over and over like a cow chewing the cud. It just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling, and it's run away with your mind at that point. And now you think that person is the worst person on the face of the earth. I mean, they are like Satan incarnate, Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer. They're, you know, they're Karl Marx. They are everything. Stalin, they are the baddest of the bad. When really they're just like your cousin and they didn't do something bad. You just see it like you want to see it and you're not seeing who they are, somebody who needs Jesus. You just see what you want to see because your attention isn't on Jesus. If somebody comes to you with that kind of attitude and you begin to feel yourself going down that road, your immediate thought should be, I need to pray because my, now my attention is not on Jesus. My attention is on that thing, and I'm, I can feel myself snowballing. I can feel myself going down this road, and I know it's at the end of that road, and I don't want to be at the end of that road. That is, that is stress headaches. That, that is in, you know, being incapable of getting out of bed because all I'm thinking about how bad stuff is, and I don't want to go down there. I need to stay up here, so i got to put my, my, my focus on Jesus. I need to pray a little more. I need to focus more on Jesus. I need to read more scripture. Prayer puts my attention on Jesus. And then once your attention is on Jesus, your attention will determine your reaction. If your attention's on Jesus, you're going to react completely differently when, when the wind blows. You're going to react completely differently when, when the water is filling the boat. You're going to react completely in a different way when your attention is on Jesus. Have you ever been around somebody who has their attention on Jesus and they encounter what you would think would be the worst of the worst experience? Maybe it's a health thing, maybe it's a family thing, financial thing, and they walk through it with such grace and determination without wavering in their faith whatsoever. You're like, man, how do they do it? How do they do it? I mean, I walk out to cook breakfast and the stove is busted and I lose it. Or the dog is doing the dog thing. Licking the, and I go, and I'm ready for work, and the dog licks me in the face. And I'm like, why do we even have a dog? If your attention's not on Jesus, every little thing is going to pile up. So that when the big thing comes, you're not going to be able to handle it. But when you put your attention on Jesus, everything is recalibrated, everything is refocused, everything is put in an eternal perspective, and whatever you're facing, you think, well, this isn't forever. I mean, I'm going to be in heaven, and, you know, and, and eternity far outlasts this. I mean, that's Paul in Romans. The worst we experience now doesn't compare with the best we're going to experience there. It, it's not even worth putting in the same sentence. It's just so much better. I can do this now. Experiences now, trying to bring as many people to Jesus as possible if my attention's on him. But as our assignment from Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, you know, go, uh, um, uh, uh, make disciples of all nations, if that is our assignment, bring people to Jesus, if our attention is not on Jesus, we're not bringing people to Jesus. If our attention is not on Jesus, we're bringing people to whatever our attention is on. If it's on bitterness, if it's on anger, if it's on bad attitude, if it's on whatever, we're going to start drawing people to that stuff rather than drawing people to Jesus. Because we're not closer to Jesus. Like, if this monitor right here is where Jesus is at, 
and I'm walking this way towards this monitor, and this monitor's all about bitterness. If I'm walking this way, and I start bringing people with me, I can't bring people to Jesus because that's not where I'm going. I'm going somewhere else. Like, if we were going to go, you know, if, if I was at my house, and uh, Katie told me to run to Walmart and get some more bread, and I started driving to Oklahoma, that's not going to work. I mean, there's Walmart in Oklahoma. There is. But it's going to take a lot longer to get to that Walmart than that Walmart. And I can't go to where I'm supposed to be going if I'm going in the opposite direction. Jesus isn't in the direction of bitterness. Jesus isn't in the direction of anger. Jesus isn't in the direction of pride. Jesus isn't in the direction of, 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 of selfishness. He's the opposite. And if I put my attention on Jesus, I'm going to move to Jesus. Move towards Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Walk to Jesus. Prayer, put your attention on Jesus. You say, well, what if I, st- I, 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 I'll pray. I got it, preacher man. I'll pray. Jesus, that person's causing me problems. Jesus caused them some problems. Like, Jesus, give them an ingrown toenail. Jesus, like, make their car not work today. Like, don't make it blow up, but like, it, it just, it runs out of you know, oil, and they just can't start the engine, and, and, and make them have, have problems. Make them see that I'm right, Jesus, and they're wrong. Make, make them do whatever it takes, Jesus. Make them see that I'm right. Now, we might call that prayer, but that's not prayer focused on Jesus. That's prayer focused on the problem. <laughs> that's not really prayer. You, you, you're expressing your frustration, which we should be transparent with Jesus. I mean, go read the Psalms, right? David started his psalms out a lot of times in frustration. Sometimes like that. Like what was that deal, Lynette? Jesus, he was God, knocked the teeth out. But two verses later, he realized after he had talked to God more and more, no God, save him. He started out in great frustration. But the longer he talked to God, read it in the psalms, the longer he talked to God, By the end, every single time, he talks about praising God. He talks about healing the people, even the people who were bad to him. Because what prayer had done for David was prayer refocused his attention, got it off of the person, got it off of the problem, and put it on Jesus. Because prayer puts our attention on Jesus, and attention determines reaction. How you react is a reflection of where you have focused your attention. How you react is a reflection of where you have focused your attention. So maybe more prayer is needed in order to recalibrate your wandering attention so that your reactions become more like Jesus. So ask the question, what has your reaction to your circumstances been lately? What has your reaction been to those people been lately? And if you begin to answer that question honestly, ask the question, where is your attention really? Is it on Jesus or not? Do you need an attention adjustment? Do you need Jesus like the disciples coming to you, walking through your storm over the very thing you feel is overwhelming you? Do you need Jesus To come to you and say, do not be afraid, it is I. Look to me, follow me, and you will find everything you need to accomplish the tasks I've put before you to accomplish. So the question for everybody, will you come to Jesus? Will you bring your problems to Jesus? Come to Jesus today. If if you don't know Jesus, believe in him today. That he is the son of God. He died so all your sins would be forgiven. He rose from the dead so you can live after you die. Come to Jesus. Introduce yourself to Jesus. He already knows you. You might as well come. Come to know him. Believe in him. Or maybe you need to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, my attention has not been on you. My attention's been on this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. I've got my checklist of prayers. I pray that every day, but really, Jesus, my, 
my attention has not been on you in that. My, my, my attention has been on my frustration about this deal, about this health thing, about this financial thing, about this person. My, my, my attention has been here, and it's not been on you. And so my reaction has been poor <laughs> when all this other stuff happens. Maybe you need to come to G- Jesus and say, I need an attention adjustment. So however you need to come to Jesus today, he will welcome you, however you are. You don't have to get right before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he takes care of that. You got to come to him first. You got it backwards if you think you, you got to get everything right before you come to Jesus. It's like the disciples and, and, and feeding the 5,000. Getting right is something you can't accomplish, That's the feeding the 5,000. You can't do it by yourself. You need him. So you got to come to him first. So will you come to Jesus today however you are? 